Okay, let me, let me go ahead and pull it back together as we consider and continue to move through this whole concept of recalibrating, of redirecting or reorganizing our lives around what's most important in life. Starting with our first message, which had to do with the theme of life, that each one of us as believers should have a theme or a central purpose that guides our lives. As Christians, that we are ones who have been chosen by God in 1 Peter chapter 2, as those who are a holy priest or a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's possessions, that we might proclaim his excellencies. That our lives, regardless of where we are in life, whether we are in the marketplace, whether we're a student, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, or whether you're working in the marketplace, wherever we are in life is that our lives should be ordered by a central theme, which is to be his people, this new identity, and we're to embrace that, and then we're to communicate the, the goodness of God, the, the gospel, to proclaim his excellencies amongst those around us in our world. That's our theme in life, regardless of where we are in life, whether it's students and athletes and coaches, wherever we are in life, that that's to be our theme. And we talked about last week, then that should overflow into our time. How we manage our time, it should be an intentionality where it's God's person, who he is, it should be a priority in our schedule that we look at each day to say, God, I'm gonna prioritize you. And then secondly, his purpose, God's purpose on the planet, it should, you should be able to look at my schedule and my life and throughout the week and say, you know, Tom, as a Christian, not just as a pastor, but as a Christian, his life is driven or motivated by the theme of God's purposes on the planet. Thirdly is not only that, but God's his a person, his purpose, but also his people, that God's people are part of that. Inherent within that, scripturally, is that there's this call to one another, this community of faith that God brings us into. And then lastly, God's provision, that wherever he has to sustain you, that should be a priority, and it should reflect itself in our time. So now we're going to go on to this third T, as you were from the theme, the time, to the treasure. What particularly having to do with stewarding God's money. What does it mean to steward God's money? As we recalibrate our lives, what does it mean as God's people that when God gets hold of our hearts, it's to reflect itself in how we steward money? Now, I was just thinking to myself is there's two things historically some have said that pastors and congregations have in common. They both hate financial stewardship messages. You know, <laughs> um, I, I don't think that should be true. In fact, I think instead it should be something we willingly embrace. And I'm actually very excited about it for a couple of reasons. First, from my own life, as I was praying about this and the message this week and just thinking, Lord, how are, is, how are Dawn and I doing, my wife and I? How are we doing in managing what you've given us to steward? Because we want to have our theme, our purpose, and our love for God reflected in how we manage his money. And as we unfold the passage this morning, you'll see how that connects. And secondarily is, I think what happens is that if you don't manage the money well that God has given you, it is a joy robber. It will rob you of joy. And you can have all the money in the world. And I've, had, I've been fortunate to spend some time with some of the, literally the wealthiest people in the world, literally the wealthiest family in the world I spent some time with at one point because I was a limo driver. <laughs> yeah, it was because I was a limo driver in Los Angeles in a private account. And I, at that point, this is before the high tech thing all it got cut loose. And I drove a Rothschild, which was a, she was the family, part of the family, the Rothschild family in the Guinness Book of World Records at that point, was the wealthiest family in the world. And I had the opportunity to drive the president of Coca-Cola and uh, some artists and, and uh, different folks. They just were wealthy people in Southern California. And I might spend a day or two with them, and you get a good inside look at their lives. And one of the things you realize very quickly is that the one common denominator in most of those cases that I saw is they lacked, guess what? Joy. And if we don't manage God's resources that he's given us to manage, if we don't manage our money well, it'll, be, it'll rob us of joy. There's a second reason, and I, and I want, um, my heart's desire was that you would be filled with joy. I think we can speak on behalf of all the elders and deacons and as leaders and staff, is that our desire is that you would be maxed out with joy. There's a second reason I think it's important is that it's an, it's an anxiety enhancer. If you don't manage God's resources well, the one thing you can guarantee is you will have, guess what? Anxiety. It's going to come with it. Your life, you're going to be anxious about money. You're going to be anxious about tomorrow. 
And my hope, by God's grace, is that you, that would be something that God would address and that sets you free from that anxiety that often accompanies finances. And then lastly, is that when we think about that, is that, and maybe even most importantly, not only does it rob you of joy, a joy robber and, and anxiety enhancer, but also if you don't handle God's money well, is it, you're, it's a reward waster, a reward waster. What do I mean by that? That means as we look at God's word is there's going to be a day when each one of us in this room, whether you know Christ or not, will stand before God. As a believer, the issue is not a judgment of heaven or hell because Christ has paid for that on the cross when he died for me. But there'll be a time of evaluation, a, a life end review, where I will give an account with how well I have stewarded my life and also and particularly the finances that God has given me to steward. I will have a time of accountability before God. And so this is super important. I'm excited about it because I know that you as a, as a body are, are people by and large that love God and want to please God. And so we want to open God's word and say, Lord, show us, continue to encourage us. And I think it's been a while since we've had a chance to open the word and look specifically at, at how to manage the resources God's given us in the context of finances. And so I, I look forward with anticipation. So with that, join with me in our text, which is Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, as he is, is walking the earth, as he's communicating with his disciples about the Christian life of what he's calling them to, he's teaching them how to pray and fast. And now he's going to be talking about finances in chapter 6 of Matthew. And he says this to his disciples. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But in contrast, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So right from the start, he's helping them understand that there is this best place to invest the most secure place to invest, he's saying is, don't make it all about here. Don't store up for your treasures here on earth. Don't make it all about the here and now. But instead, put in a place where it's protected and you're going to get the greatest return. Send it ahead. He says, I want you to put it in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, but that's where you're going to get the greatest return. It'll be secure. It's not going to be impacted by the fluctuation in the markets or it's not going to be impacted by the housing industry. It's going to be impacted by God who secures it and holds that investment. And so right from the start, he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in, where it's insecure, where, it, it can, where it'll be a place where it can be corroded, undermined, and devalued. But in contrast, verse 20, Again, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy. So the best place to invest your money is in heaven. Yeah, that's, it's not a trick question. So the best place to invest your money is heaven. That's right. That's the most secure, best place. It's not through Schwab. It's not through Dean Witter. It is through God. He says, I want you to invest with me. I'm going to give you the greatest return. Lay it for yourselves treasures in heaven. So Jesus is underscoring that. And then he's going to talk about the impact of, and he uses this metaphor of how when that, there's a failure to understand that and we start to focus on treasures here and money, it clouds our perspective. It clouds our ability to see things. So verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if the eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. So he's saying is, okay, right from the start, he's using this metaphor. He's saying, so the eye is the one that gives light, right? Or when the light comes through, it allows you to see. Now, he's saying, he's saying a healthy eye is you're going to see things correctly. You're going to see the light. But if the eye is bad, it's not functioning the way it should, your whole body will be full of darkness. In other words, you're not going to see things. If then the light is in you is darkness, I would submit to you in context. In other words, is you're, you're putting up treasures on earth, not in heaven. If your, if your eye is darkness, he says, how great is the darkness? Now, this is important. So notice he goes on to say, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's like, wow. He's saying, I want you to get this. This is important. He puts an exclamation point as in the text is at the end of verse 23. How great is the darkness? In other words, this is important. If you allow your heart to be devoted to the love of money, it's going to cloud your vision. It's going to be darkness to what you should be seeing and what God is doing. It'll be dark. And he says, this is important. I want you to understand you cannot serve me and serve money. There's got to be a priority to it. You've got to understand that it is to love God with our first fruits and, and all that he is, that he is the number one love of our lives. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, again, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures, not here, but what's to come. So let me give you a two, two, couple thoughts here. The first one is simply this in the text, is that your use of money ultimately reveals your heart. How we, how I, how you spend money, ultimately, how you invest what God has given you to steward, how how you spend your money ultimately reveals your heart. Notice what he gets. He goes on to say in the text. He says, this is, he says, for verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, it's a really interesting phrase because it cuts both, or it it, it communicates two things, both ways on it. Because on one hand, it reveals what's most important to you. On one hand, it's kind of a a heart revealer. It helps you really see what your motives are. So your your money, in a sense, will trail. It'll trail what's most important to you. You tend to invest your money what's most important. But secondarily, and I think that one of the primary implications of the text, he says, where your treasure, your heart will be also. Another way to look at this and should encourage all of us, particularly in in at least most of our journeys, is that we've gotten to a place in life where most of us, we come to Christ and we want to hang on to our money. It's a little bit like closed fist, right? And then what God says, now I want you to realize, guess what? That's not even yours in the first place. That's mine. And I want you to steward it well. And so it's a little bit like... (laughs) You know, it's just like, we got to get a prior hands open, right? So what he says, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So as I give to the Lord's work, what's going to happen is that God's going to deal, guess what, with my, my heart. Because where your treasure is, where I put my money, your heart will be also, is that my heart has an opportunity to grow. So as I choose even when I don't feel like it yet, when I choose to steward God's resources in a way that honors him, my heart follows with it. It is a growing, maturing process. It goes both ways. Our money is invested where what we value most. So in a sense, if you should look at my checkbook or look at each of our checkbooks, if that was revealed on a screen above, you should be able to say, whoever that is, I can tell you what's important to them based on how they spend their money. In the same way, for us who know this is a challenge and a journey for every single one of us, it should encourage us as we choose to honor God and and we choose to say, Lord, I'm going to steward it well, then we can, even when I don't feel like it yet, quite yet, is that my heart will follow that. There'll be a maturing process in that. So it offers great hope to us. It reveals what's most important to us. And it reveals our spiritual health. And that's the whole metaphor that follows in verse 22 and 23 is this, this whole concept of the eye and light is that if we choose to not do that, if we choose to keep this, this, this really tight grasp on what we think is our money, that he says, you're going to get blinded. You're not going to be healthy spiritually. There's going to be a darkness where you can't see things the way they should. You're not going to comprehend what God's doing in your life because you're going to be so grasped to this. And so God is saying, I want you to be ones that understand that money reveals ultimately your what? Your heart, how we invest God's money. Let me submit a couple of the thoughts to you as it pertains to this. And, and these, as we go through this, is, is again, in, in thinking through the series of recalibrate, it's a little different than what we've done historically or what is a mainstay at Crossway. Historically, what we do is we just teach through books of the Bible. Periodically, we pull out and we do a series like Recalibrate when we think it's important for us as a body to zero in on it. But it's it's different from our mainstay, main diet, as it were, of the scriptures on Sunday morning. So this is one of those times where it's a little different. So it's more of on a topical sense. And I want to give you some thoughts on, on what might it look like or guidelines as we consider managing God's money. Let me, let me give you some guidelines. And it's going to help address maybe some of the why for some of us. Like the why do I 
do that or, and, and the what? What does it look like? And then next week, we'll look at a strategy for eternal investment. A strategy for internal investment. So let's, let's look at this together. The first thing I want you to see is that my money, when I think of my money, what, what I'm called to steward, what I have some responsibility over, first and foremost, is God's money. It's not mine in the first place. It's God's money. This was important for me to understand really early when I, as a young Christian, as I, I, I graduated from school, brought me to Los Angeles with a job, and I was in the marketplace, and I had real money for the first time. And I had a chance to steward, and, and I had to get to this realization pretty well, and I was fortunate enough to do that for some other mentors around me, is to help me understand is that what I had was actually a stewardship from God. It's actually his money. It's his money that I'm called to manage or steward. That was, so first things, and we see this in Psalm 24, where it says, the earth is the Lord's and all that it contains. So everything on the earth is God's, including my money. <laughs> That's God's. So I had to come to grips with the realization is God that everything of me, I'm yours, God, that, and the, the resources you give me to manage, that's yours too. Now, that's a big distinction, right? Because no longer, it's not, you don't think, well, mine, 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 but you think his, his, right? There's a big difference when I realize that I'm actually stewarding somebody else's money and how I spend this. And there's some freedom in that, right? And again, because we want to be those that address the joy robbers, the anxiety enhancers, and the reward wasters. We want to be people that recognize that, God, my, my life is yours. I want to have that kind of joy. In Colossians 1, it says that we, verse 16, we've been made by God and what? For God. So you've been made by God for him. And all the earth is his. So the money that I have to steward is not mine, it's God's. Huge point to understand, very important to grab hold of is, and if you're new in Christ or you're considering Christianity, one of the things that'll help you experience the joy of the Lord is to realize that this is not yours. It's his. And so I want to manage it well. I want to be one that says, God, I want to manage what you've given me well. Let me give you a second guideline or consideration. As it were, to trust in God, not wealth. We're to be people that trust in God, not wealth. We're to be those who don't trust in what we have in the bank account or that what we assume or what we're projecting to make. That's not our faith, it's not in that. It's not in the arm of the flesh, but it's in God. Let me help you see this in 1 Timothy. If you have a Bible, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul is writing to Timothy in Ephesus. He's writing back to them. He's left them there to help put the church in order. And uh, he is, he's trying to encourage him. And so if you hit 1 Thessalonians, keep going. 1 Timothy, if you hit Hebrews and Revelation, Titus, go back to your left. But let me just read it for the sake of time. And what he's doing is he's encouraging them. He talks about the church and what it's to be like. And one of the things he instructs, one of the individuals and groups of people he instructs is, are those who he refers to as rich. Now, I know for most of you in this room, if not all of you, at least probably most of you, immediately said, well, that doesn't, matter to me because I'm not what? Okay. So outside of our brother who just spoke on finances. The, um, so in that, his name is Rich Kearns. Okay. So, the, uh, so with that is that one of the things we have to understand is that the reality is that when we think of globally in history, we are as, an, as a nation are financially more well off than 99% of human beings in history. We are in the one percentile. And then even when it comes to our country current day, we are in the financial Disneyland of quality of life in, in the world. We are in the Disneyland. There's a reason why people are trying to come here. There's a reason. Even the, you think about this, even the middle class, the middle class is it, this is even like 1950, it wasn't that long ago, right? Some of us were born around 1950, is that the average size of a home, I was just reading some just statistics this week, is that the average of the home is 1,500 square feet. You know the average home uh, for now is approximately 2,500 square feet? I mean, just think about just the size of the homes that we live in. Is that we're in a unique place. I've had a chance to travel, I've spent some time in Mexico and Europe and Asia. And one of the things you realize is that people live very differently than we do. 
I mean, just even coming back from, from the Philippines after six weeks, and one of the things I noticed is we, cut our, we water our lawns to cut it. I mean, I don't get it. Like, 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 just think about that. I mean, I water my lawn. Americans spend money to water their lawns to cut it and, 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 and to fertilize it and keep it green. I'm like, I mean, I didn't see any green lawns in the Philippines, except maybe at the palace or something in Manila. But, but outside of that, it's just a different type of world we live in. And we live in a Disneyland. Of, if you have not had a chance to travel, take the opportunity if you do get a chance to. And in particular, and maybe do some documentaries on, wor- on world economy. Or, and it, the reality is that scripture, ref- I believe, is that most of us in this room would qualify in the context if, if for rich. And so what he goes on to say is this, verse 17. This, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, in other words, arrogant, nor to, be, nor to set, this is the important part, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. I love that. He said, what he's saying is, us, because I, I, again, I think from a historical standpoint, and we would be included in this text based on the quality and standard of life that 95% of us in here live. And what he would be saying to us, he says, don't set your hope on the uncertainty of your money or your riches. Don't put your hope here. Don't put your hope here. He says, don't put your hope here. He exhorts them, don't be focused on yourself, but instead, I want you to trust in God, that God is your provider. He always has been. He always will be. Trust not in your wealth, but in God. Let me give you a third one. Be content with whatever situation God has you in. Be content with whatever situation God has you in. Notice back in Philippians, turn back to your left in Philippians. If you hit Colossians, keep going back to your left is that in that is that we see that in Philippians chapter four, what, what Paul do is he's writing to the church of Philippi and he's helping them understand that the contentment is part of the Christian life. And if you're to have joy, which is the central theme uh, of the book of Philippians, he says the, the contentment has to be a part of that. If not, it's gonna be a joy robber. In Philippians chapter four, he talks about this contentment and the need to be people that say, Lord, I'm trusting in you. My life is in your hand. Verse 11, he says this. Now that I am speaking of of being in need, let's go back to verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So again, he's writing back to the church of Philippi, Paul is. He says, now that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be, what? Content. In other words, I'm to be okay with, Lord, I trust you. I'm to be with content, con with with, is I'm to be with, Lord, with a, a satisfaction and a contentment. It says, God, I trust you. I, I'm a, I, I trust you with where you have me. It's not this drivenness or this anxiety or this ungratefulness, he says, or this entitlement. He says, I want you to whatever situation you're in to be content as Paul was testifying of his own life. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low I know how to be abound in every circumstance, in any circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty. That means when things are going very, very well and hunger, when things aren't going as well financially, abundance where you have more than you need and in need, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, I like that because even as I've thought about it and I've used the verse in times and heard it used in the past that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, the context has everything to do with contentment. I can be content in every circumstance because God strengthens me to do that. I can trust God in every circumstance he has me in because he strengthens me to be content. That's the emphasis of the passage. And so as we think about managing the resources God's given us to steward is that we have to recognize one of those guidelines is not to have this kind of drivenness of of lack of contentment, of anxiety, of just drivenness that I've got to get more, I've got to get more. Now, it doesn't mean we don't work heartily as into the Lord, right? We we understand scripture. It has a couples it with other passages. It says, I want you to work heartily as into the Lord. I want you to work hard. I want you to be able to have resources that you can bless others with. God gives us all these things to enjoy. So it's not like everybody's supposed to be in sackcloth and ashes 
and riding old bicycles here on Sunday morning through the snow, but that God's calling us to be people that say, whatever God has given us, whatever place he's called us, there should be this contentment and this gratitude to say, God, my life is yours and I'm grateful. All that you've given me, Lord, is you, and it's, it's a blessing from you. Every gift that's come, every ability to work as unto you, and the resources that I've acquired from that, God, I am grateful for that. So it's a contentment. Let me give you a, another one. Live off of what God provides. Live off of what God provides. Number four is from Proverbs 22. We see this principle. We are to be people that say, God, whatever you've given me, that's what I want to live off of. Now, what does that mean in contrast? If we're to live off of what God provides in Proverbs 22, it, I'm going to, as we're turning there, is that what does it mean? Well, Proverbs 22, verse 7, it says this. It says, the rich rules over the poor. And then it says, and the borrower, those who, who's in debt, is the slave of the lender. And the borrower is the slave of the lender. Now, that's a general principle of life. If you live in debt, if you say, God, I, I am going to spend more of this than I have, than you've given me, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have contentment, then you're going to find yourself in situations where you're indebted to someone. You're indebted to a credit agency. You're indebted to maybe some investors who've invested. And, and you have to be careful how you do that. Do you have the ability to pay them back? So he says, I want you to be really careful. So make sure, and here's the driving principle, is that don't live beyond what God provides. Don't spend what you don't have. Now, my father was Scottish, and Scots have a reputation. You know what the reputation is? They're really frugal, and they are. But, but just for, my, for the sake of my dad, um, he, he would say this. He said, um, frugal with ourselves, gracious with others. And there's a principle about that too. Interesting enough though, by, if you've ever read the Millionaire Next Door book, it's the second, Scots are the second most millionaires in the United States for probably that primary reason. But anyway, the, the point is this, is that we are to be ones that live off of what God provides, is that we don't spend more than we have. And so one of the things, even as I considered, and let me challenge you young people, and for those of you parents who are, who are trying to, to get your kids to college and thinking about debt, let me challenge you to consider very carefully of your children acquiring debt to go to college. Some of them, and some of them pursuing soft uh, degrees. What I mean by that is that they're in more of the social sciences. Soft, not by way of it getting through. That could be really hard to get through. Classical education can be hard. Like. But the reality is what I'm saying is that if you're not going to get a job that you can basically bring a lot of money in, is you need to be careful how much debt you acquire. I, I had a ministry at Wheaton College for years, for about five years. Wheaton College is an expensive school. Some of you may know that. It's a Christian school, it's supposed to be Christian in roots and all, and, it, and they have a Christian bent to it. But one of the things I always wrestled with, and I, and I would talk to some of the people that, that were getting degrees, and that, that were, there's not even, like a pastor, some of them going for pastoral degrees, accumulating huge amount of debt, both husband and wife. And I, I remember looking, I'm saying, how in the world are you ever gonna pay that back? As a pastor, now if you're a doctor, that's one thing, right? If, if you're gonna if you're gonna be a doctor, that you know, it's in the the, the top eight. I, I just this week I, I read through the top eight professions in every state, in the union, and almost all of them were in medicine, that by way of generating income. Well, that's one thing, right? But for, but to think through, why would you go into debt to saddle yourself with all this? So one of the commitments we made, and as a family, is we would seek to do all we could to help our kids to go through school without debt. One of the ways we did that is I started a small real estate investment business on the side. I put 10 hours a week into it. Primarily so my kids could go to college without debt. Now, that's, that's a harkicism. I'm not saying you have to get a second job, but just thinking through, what, why are, you, are we as parents allowing our kids to sign a debt note? They don't have a comprehension of debt yet that'll saddle them for the next 30 or 40 years. In fact, the couple I was telling you about they actually were interns of mine at one point. Um, he was, and he was, his wife was a big part of the ministry as well. And I would ask him, I said, now, how are you going to do this? Like, like, what does it look like? He just paid off his debt in his mid-50s. He carried Wheaton College school debt until his 50s. I mean, what did that mean for him? So just to think through as parents, you know, as we are to be ones, not just in the big areas, but also um, when it comes to just, or I should say the most obvious areas, like each day, you know, you just you don't spend more than you comes in on the credit card and you, you're carrying a credit card. But even the big decisions, we have to really think through, is that the best way to do that? I w is it better to slow down and go through school without debt? Is it better to do it that way? Maybe, maybe not. Again, I'm not asking, saying this is a harkicism and you have to do it this way. I'm just saying we just need to think about it. 
just to stop and go, wait a minute, we got to stop the madness in some respect is when we see our young singles acquiring debt that they don't have any comprehension of. When they say, hey, I'm graduating with a degree in social science and I'm going to be a social worker, and you're graduating with a $50,000 debt? They don't understand that. They don't know what that's going to mean for someone who's going to be a social worker. That, that's, that's, that somehow that's going to just take care of itself over time, you know, right? So we need to be people to say, wait a minute, let's slow down here a little bit. And let's ask ourselves, is this what God wants? But even the most obvious ways is, are we spending more than it's coming in? Or is there instead a contentment that says, God, I trust you. I don't want to be a, indebted to anyone. I, I want to trust you for. And if you are in debt, let me encourage you to prioritize getting out of debt. Whatever we can do as, as believers to look through our budget, say, God, I want to do whatever I can to focus on spending more of my, the money you've given me in the resource to settle the debt that I have, to get out of debt, to bless other people, right? Now, I, I understand the challenge of that. I've, I've, um, I, I understand that it's a unique place. A lot of us are already, there's a lot of water underneath the bridge and we've got debt. Well, let me encourage you, is it, prior, let's prioritize prayerfully. How can we get out of debt? How can we help you? We have resources available that will help you think that through. We're going to have some links and other resources and books and pamphlets that will help you think through this. How can you honor the Lord with where he has you? So one big way is live off of what God provides. Particularly, again, for you parents and, and raising young adults is help them understand the value of money. Help them understand that what that means. Help them make sure they work for what they get. You know, all those different things, right? Help them understand the value of hard work that comes with a dollar made. Okay, that's, but you know, I'm pre preaching to the choir. I, I don't know anyone here that doesn't do that. I just want to encourage us, to let, let's be people that are all the more encouraging our, our young ones to think through with the value of money and that we li don't live beyond what we have. Okay, let me give you another thought. Invest toward life and review. Invest in toward life and review. Second Corinthians chapter five, to invest in life and review tells us that there's going to be a day when, when as believers, we will stand before God, the judge, this time of, of this, what referred to as some as the Bema seat of Christ, this reward seat in second Corinthians chapter five, verse 10, it says, for we, speaking of Christians, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is not having to do with heaven and hell. It'll tell us this comma, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And you tie this into 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as well. And there is, this is referring to more of rewards as believers, not heaven and hell. It's not what we see in Revelation 20 at the end for judgment, but it's here as believers. There's, there's a time that we're going to stand before God and give an account with how well I've invested his money. So one of the things I, it's important for me and for my family is that I have to think through is, Lord, how are we doing managing your money? Because someday I'm going to stand before you and give an account for how well I've done that. And there are times I go, you know what? That was a waste. That was, that was just not well invested. But even whatever, just on a daily basis before, whether buy a pair of shoes or, 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 or do I need a new sweater? Lord, this is your money. Lord, do you, do you want me to get a sweater? Do I need a new sweater? Do, Lord, Lord do you, what about this cup of coffee? Do I need to spend six bucks on a cup of coffee? I mean, you know, you know, all these different things I need to think through in my life. Now, by the way, sometimes I do. But it's like in a date night, and we try to split it with Don and I, and it, it's, it, it's, again, this is a harkicism. You know, all of a sudden, we've got to split our cups of coffee at Starbucks. No, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to help you understand where that intersects us, where we've kind of wrestled through those same things. But what does this really mean for us? That, Lord, we understand that we're to invest with a life and review because we know that, God, it's all your money. Psalm 24, verse 1, it's all yours. And so, Lord, how can I invest my life? How, how am I doing? Because someday I will give an account for the, this commodity that you've called me to do, to invest in, to, to steward, to manage for you. It's not mine, it's yours. Now, there are, there are situations where I've, I've heard of it. I've had the privilege to, to spend time and minister to startup and business owners for about two years, 30 business owners in, in Colorado. And, uh, and also trying to help some young guys get started here. And one of the things... Um, there was a situation that arisen. It was an example, and I was being brought in to counsel this situation. And one of them was, is that the startup, they had given management responsibilities to another person that came up. The owner gave this other person management responsibilities. And the manager decided to say and represent himself to the clients and customers as the owner of the company and started to make decisions with the money of the company as if he, what, was the owner of the company. And so one of the challenges was, we, you know, we would look at that and go, well, that's, that's terrible, right? That he would, 
pretend, not only pretend to be the owner, but, but spend money as if it was his money instead of the company's owner, instead of the owner's own, that own the money, owner's money. Well, that's what we do when, when I forget that this is his. When, when I start to think, well, it's all me. It's all mine. Now, I have the utmost respect for men and women who God has entrusted a lot of money to, resources to. I mean, a lot of money. Because you know what? That's a yoke that can be hard to handle. I mean, that's a responsibility because I know that someday God's going to hold them accountable for this. And so I think they was like, wow, that, that's a lot to be responsible for. Maybe it's one of the reasons God hasn't entrusted me with a lot of money. Right? See, like, I'm gonna, because that's going to be someday they're going to stand before God and give an account for how well they've managed it. And I've seen brothers and sisters invest in the kingdom in beautiful ways too. I, I, one example I think of when, when the Berlin or when the communist wall came down is uh, I, there was one brother I know of, his money opened up Mongolia. His, his money opened up the, the, the country of Mongolia, which as far as I knew and heard about at that point, there were 16 known believers in the country. And his money came right into there and opened up and sent a lot of missionaries and money flooded the gospel into that. And that was his money. Can you imagine being in a place as a believer to say, you know what? I have the privilege to open up the, the, a country to the gospel with just my money. I mean, what would that be like? Can, can you imagine the privilege of what, I mean, wow, the Lord might give us more of those kind of people, right? That have that kind of heart. So it's a unique calling when God gives us money to understand that it's gonna be invested and we need to invest with the end and review in mind. Let me give you one more. Or let me give you two more. Guard your heart from the love of money. Guard your heart from the love of money. First, uh, back to 1 Timothy 6. Again, Paul exhorts those who were rich um, and I would say that qualifies us by and large in here. He, he says, I want you to be careful here and he says, I want you to guard it. And, and in that, why? Because we see six through 10, the, the challenges that come with it. Look in verse six, he says this. In First Timothy chapter six, again, as Paul is writing to Timothy in Ephesus, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, notice what happens, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through these cravings that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Notice the downside. Let me just highlight a couple of words here. As we pursue money, we let our hearts go toward money. Notice what the downside is. Words like senseless, harmful, ruin, destruction, evils, wandered from the faith, pierced themselves with many pangs. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what all that means, but I don't want it. Is that fair to say? I mean, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, we could say, we could try to unpack what those might mean. And some of us may have examples that we might cite. But whatever those are, I don't want it. I want to be one that says, God, you have given me money to steward and I want to do it well. I, I want to steward it well. And I know that if I don't guard my heart from the love of money, there's going to be this, <laughs> this kind of a never satisfied enough kind of craving to make it happen. And God says, I don't want that for you. I've got far more for you. And then lastly, for our time together this morning, it's more blessed to give than receive. It's more blessed. In Acts 20, Paul in verse 35, he's with the elders at Ephesus. They've come down from Ephesus to the port city of Mileta there. And he's, he's encouraging them. And as, as he's on his way to Jerusalem, these are elders that he's invested his life with. And he talks about being one that says, I, didn't, I wasn't a burden to you financially. I was a tent maker. I made point to say that, you know, I'm going to provide myself through my own labor so as not to charge you in Ephesus for ministry. And, he, and then he goes on to say, for it is more blessed to give than receive. Now, we might say that kind of reluctantly, but for those of us who have had the privilege to be in situations to give, we know that that is absolutely unequivocally true. 
that we get a chance to invest or to give to people, people in need around us, and we're able to write them a check, or, or we see opportunities in ministries as we're having the opportunity to open a part of, of Mexico to unreached people groups and invest in the, um, the mountains there the, with different places where we're starting the school. But there's opportunities that we have as believers to be a part of this grand story of God's, and one of the key ways we get to do that is through the stewardship of money. So how do we practically start to honor the Lord? Let me submit a couple thoughts. How do we practically, you know, what does this really mean? How do we practically get started on this? What does this mean? Well, if we're going to be ones that don't have our joy robbed, if we're, we're going to be ones that avoid this anxiety enhancers or these reward wasters, then let me submit a couple things. One is that how do I practically start with God is, is, to, is to simply make your spending visible. Start with just writing down where your money's going. You say, I've never had a budget. I don't know where to start. Well, well there's, there, we can come alongside you. There's also tutorials and videos that'll help you as well in that through YouTube and all. But is, the, is to help you understand is just the how, Lord, can, can I start to steward the money by making it visible? We can also encourage you to just to follow up with us, to get some resources into your hands as leadership, those in the financial team as well as, uh, as pastors. We can get some resources into your hands. But I think the bottom line is this. The bottom line is, is a heart issue, is a heart issue, is to say, Lord, this is yours. It, it's a hard attitude that says, God, this is yours. And some of you will look at next week when we talk about strategies for eternal investment. Some of you say, well, I don't make any money. I'm, I, well, I just make so little. Let me, I'm going to encourage you to start with 10%. We'll talk about that next week as a starting place of 10%. And then because you, well, I don't have my money. Well, 10% of not much is not much. It's a good place to start. Our giving should bring us in the realm of faith. I'm getting ahead of it. Next week, we'll, go, we'll, we'll elaborate in details on this with a lot of stories, which are really cool of how God's provided. Let me give you one, one real quick one. It's the most re- one of the most recent ones. Is that we tried it, Don and I, we made a commitment since before I got married, is to say, you know, um, I'm not going to tell anybody about my needs and we're just going to pray. We're just going to pray. And so we've had story after story of how God has faithfully provided for us. And so this, uh, about two months ago, I was driving my vehicle. My vehicle has 311,000 miles on it. And, um, and I, I buy, I've bought new vehicles as a pastor that are 10 years old. That's my new vehicle of the last you know, several years. And so this car, I started to have some issues with it. It's leaking oil and it's got some issues. And, and I, I was driving and I said it out loud. I said, I said, I wonder how the Lord's going to provide for us. He's always provided for his vehicles and always provided for us. I remember just saying, I wonder how he's going to do that this time because I don't have any money in the bank for a new vehicle. And so I said, I, I wonder what it's going to look like, Lord. And that was on Wednesday. And then Friday, I, I'm with a friend who has supported my travel for ministry. And I picked him up in the vehicle. By the way, that was not a strategy. You know, that, was, that, that, that was just, that was the vehicle I had. So I picked him up in the vehicle, and he asked, he says, hey, how do you like the vehicle? And I said, yeah, I, I, love, the, I love the vehicle. I've got sciatic nerve issues. I'm tall. It's a Sequoia. It's big. And he said, oh, cool. So then we're walking in the building. I'm going to show him the building. He's here from out of town. And he says, can I speak to my wife for a moment? And I said, yeah, sure. And so he speaks to his wife for a few minutes, and he comes in. And he says, hey, Tom, can I speak to you for a second? And I said, sure. And he says, hey, how would you feel if we get you a, a 2019 new Sequoia? You can put anything you want on it. And uh, we'll lease it, you carry the insurance, and then after five, five years, you, you buy it for me for a buck. Uh, sounds good. Um, <laughs> now, do you think he's going to be blessed? By the way, that's the new Sequoia that you've seen in that out there, um, which I hit a deer with a couple weeks ago, but that's another story. But the, um, <laughs> but the point is, is this, is that, you know, some of you might going, you know, you see me drive up in a six, $60,000 vehicle and you go, um, you know, ministry been very, very good to Tom. You know, you're going like, you know, well, that's not it. It's God's providing. Now, God has, do you think God is blessing that individual for giving me that research? Do you think God's, do you think there was joy in him giving me that? Absolutely. 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 And, and as a recipient of that is I say, God, you are so great. Yes, I'm grateful for the, for the brother and how God burned his heart, but I'm more grateful to God. God is the one who moved in his heart. He's always our provider. I mean, I've got story after story that makes me just ashamed of his love for me. It's like over the top, like, Lord, it's too much. I can't just like, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just like overwhelming of how he's provided time and time again of just financially. As we say, God, we're gonna honor you with first fruits. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that next week and just seeing how he is. And in the intimacy, what does it mean for my intimacy with God? Because 
when we give and, and, and stewardship is, is a window into intimacy with God because when you see his hand and as you've given sacrificially in a place like, Lord, I have to give to you and it's sacrificial, I'm not exactly sure how it all works out. And you see God provide and his glory and manifest. And you go, God, you love me so much. And there's this intimacy that comes from it. So many of us are so satisfied with so little because we're, we're over here like this. Just trying to hang on, Lord. You know, we got this little $1 bill hanging out of this $1 bill, and God says, you know what? Just open up your hands. I've got so much more for you. I've got so much more for you. So what might God do if we respond saying yes, Lord? What, if each one of us say, Lord, wherever we are, just take that next step to say, Lord, this is all yours. Just help me to honor you with it. It's all yours. What might God do with this body, with Crossway Fox Valley? Who wants to find out? Don't you want to find out to see what God does with us, each one of us, right where we are in our journey? Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? I'm going to invite the worship team up as we respond with a time around the Lord's Supper. Just, I'm going to ask you to think through as we go into the Lord's Supper is to say, Lord, let, let this be a time of dedication and commitment to say, Lord, I want to trust you 